Thanks a lot. Um, I uh, have to say that um, we, when we discussed on, on, on what to present, we, I, we came to uh, this title of transition from development to service and lessons learned. And I realized that normally we pre have presentations where we show individual projects. And now this is a bit of a turnaround of saying like, what have we to say distilled out of it? And I found this very exciting. And it also meant that I had to redo this entirely. So I'm actually very excited um, to actually share this. At the same time, I have to admit, we don't have a synchrotron and we don't, um, I'm likely also not as smart as Giuseppe. So I think it's more from a mundane point of view of um, being embedded in a core facility and things that we can do. And that's actually even directly where I want to start because this is, I wanted to start actually with a question that goes out to you um, as the audience um, and I hear think mostly of people in Eurobioimaging that run or are part of core facilities. So how are you organized? Because when we think of innovation, this is a very crucial part because um, do you have even a mandate for innovation? This may be sounding like a very crucial or naive question, but let me bring this on a bit because most of us as core facilities are rather service centered. So, um, I want to bring to, to mind that um, here, I have been taking this from a, a publication from Robert Hase that there's a different set of uh, core facilities that would focus either, for example, on service or on maintenance or on knowledge centric, they could be training or consulting. But when it comes to imaging facilities, most of us are technically on the service centric part. And here an interesting um, bifurcation comes in, you know, we on the one hand side need to provide this service all the time. And at the same time, how do we get to the innovation part? And um, specifically here with this question that I came in, um, if we look at how our institutions often look also upon us as uh, core facilities and what our tasks are, I want to point out that um, here, taking this from a recent publication on future proving core facilities with a seven pillar model, there's many things that are mentioned as crucial ingredients of core facilities. And I'm not going to go into detail here because that leads so far, but training, career tracks, technology, trend, community, all of these are ingre crucial ingredient parts. And this is all super valid. But what is not um, immediately visible here, and I think this is a bit of a hidden uh, a pillar in this model is there is not innovation mentioned in this. And I think at the same time, we need to do this a lot. And we also know that many of our colleagues actually doing this all the time. So we intuitively have a number of people that we think, or at least I look up to and say like, how do you do this? How did you pull this off? And how much time did you spend in your daily business on doing that? In this context, we have um, conducted a survey where we actually asked our colleagues an in, in, uh, initiative called Core for Life, which is comprising of the EMBL, uh, Dresden, ETH, CRG, and some others. Um, and also us to ask how much time do you spend as an imaging core facility on innovation? And um, innovation here was loosely defined in any aspect, which this could be renewal of service portfolios, strategic planning, future proving, and what have you. And we got quite some uh, distributed answers, but what you can see is, I think it converges to a large extent to about 20% of time. And I think this is already a bit of a lesson learned here, coming back to what I wanted to convey is, how much time do we want or need to spend eventually on time for innovation? And if we benchmark this against industry, um, and we look maybe at rather a highly innovative industry, at least in the past, um, for Google, this percentage of 20% actually comes back. If we look at, for example, 3M, it's reported to be around 15%. So it's in the similar ballpark. So this is um, rather good, I think, and I think it also gives us a feedback of where we need to go to. I think the other question is, why do we want to engage in innovation? And I think here we need to look at both sides on why this is important for institutions and also why it is important for us as uh, core facilities uh, itself. Um, and we provide crucial uh, services to our stakeholders, departments, centers, institutes. But without doing that, we risk that we actually have a stagnation and we don't keep up with the cutting edge and the 
our users may actually need to find services elsewhere which they feel like uh, delivers what is their innovative uh, need uh, fulfilling their innovative needs sorry <clears throat> so innovation why does it matter and why do we need it? I mean, I think we all intuitively, that's likely why we dialed into this uh, thing is, I think we think it matters, but why does it matter is actually a reasonably good question to ask. And I think success of organization depends on innovations these days because we're in a world where things change all the time. And um, many different organizations have different advantages, but when it comes to innovation, when you can mobilize knowledge and technological skills, you can create a competitive advantage. That's why it is so crucially important to do this. And obviously, it not only matters for the institution itself, there's also the socio-economical dimension to that. Um, and then we also know in a changing world, we will know that disruption happens. So we need to future-proof ourselves in order to be ready to adapt to an environment and also have stuff up line to do and provide service when things are ch changing and happening. So. How does innovation happen? How does it really go? And I think here it was very nice and very pragmatically insightful from what uh, Giuseppe earlier mentioned here. Um, in industry, um, this is rather formalized and mentioned as two different models where you can either start from a research and development part, go to manufacturing, marketing, and to the user, where a new development has been just come up and this will be going to market. On the other hand, this can also be a pull mechanism where marketing will say, we need to develop something and then we go to marketing. When we try to translate this to our situation, we can ask, we obviously have a, the service condition in, as part of a fa core facility business. So I think here it needs to come from user need. And when I talk about what is this user need, I think it needs to fulfill the, the needs of part of a practical user group and one needs to also in order to be able to do development and innovation needs to buy in and support from the stakeholders of the uh, <clears throat> core facility because we don't operate in an empty space we have our directors and they need to be supporting that this is a good idea that we want to do here right um, at the same time we are dealing with scientists we have these requests all the time as well right we have these users that come in and say like i want to do this measurement that they did in this paper and you have not done this ever before so you need to implement it on the other hand you also have the need to sometimes measure something that has never been measured and then you actually have to create even a novelty for this so from the perspective of a core facility, what is the different aspects that we can actually go and, and uh, go ahead on, on doing some stuff? And here I want to dwell a bit on quite some few examples. We have heard earlier examples and they're awesome and great. They likely don't live up to this uh, same level. But I want to highlight is how in and core facility these can, things can work and how they can be tailored to what stuff is happening in core facilities. And I want to start with probes because probes is actually very important for us, but it's often underdeveloped. And um, here we wanted to target receptors with labeled agonists. I'm embedded in an environment where we do a lot of neuroscience and antibodies for neuroscience are all pretty bad, unfortunately. So we have conceptualized something that we see called a receptor flex, where we could actually think about choosing from a panel of agonists because we have agonists, we have antagonists, we have modulators that also work very nicely on a large number of receptors if we could utilize them for also labeling and revealing what's happening this could be a huge step forward so we teamed up with a group of chemists who started to create libraries for doing so and here there is an uh, <clears throat> nice preprint on where we got involved for new uh, fluorescent dyes for calcium channel imaging that have been tagged to uh, some uh, agonists. So this is a nice opportunity to team up because the chem we don't have the chemical knowledge, the chemists don't have the imaging knowledge. So if we combine this, we can sort of say do probe development in collaboration. And I think this is a nice example for how we can actually do this and what is possible when we think of sample preparation there's a number of ways that i want to very quickly highlight and we all have some protocols and in mind but i think there's also ways to think of this very differently and first thing i want to very quickly highlight is here for example the flamingo project from the herskin lab because here 
the idea, you could think of it as a development project for machines, but it's actually more of bringing the machine to the place where the samples are happening. And therefore I would consider it as a sample centric actually approach. It, co it coincides a bit. We have been thinking also about how we can literally ship more samples instead of having visitors, which also points into the same direction and may help. And as mentioned before, there's obviously also a number of uh, protocols that can be utilized and where new developments can be used. We at some time used an old technique called Golgi staining, which is based on depositing heavy metals into uh, brains, basically to highlight individual neurons. These heavy metals can be used after some tricks to actually reveal neurons when we put them in EM, because heavy metals is what they are, can be providing some density here. So obviously regular protocols can also be working to be turned into service, but this is, you know, different ways to look at the, the same thing. Obviously, integration of modalities is also something we have look, heard before here, I think in a way better way that I could do this from our colleagues here in, in Brno, how you can connect here also between SEM and TEM and LM. And I just wanted to highlight that I think there's a number of opportunities that lie around. We have been looking at an ELIM and system where both an electron and a light microscope are integrated and which can take immediately nice correlative images. But we turned and programmed this device in order to find individual regions of interest automatically in order to go and put these stacks together in 3D in order to uh, lift this up to a higher ground that can be useful for our users in our uh, environments to actually do 3D imaging based on array tomography in a more automated fashion. Now with that, I want to highlight quickly uh, or end uh, round up in this circle of, of different opportunities that also training is there. Um, here I want to highlight um, my colleague Jennifer Waters who is literally welcoming people for learning on the job with fellowships at Harvard and she has been publishing this also as a new paradigm for coaching and I thought to highlight this as one opportunity or how people have been implementing uh, training into uh, the innovative workflow. Now um, coming to analysis for a quick session. I always love to show this up with this kind of thing because this connects here a bit in the true spirit of Eurobioimaging between medical and light microscopy imaging. And I've been called up by a colleague at some late evening saying like, Seb, you work with images and I already knew with this creation came, there's some trouble ahead. And they have these fluoroscopy images where they look at uh, a mouse, you can see here, um, a movie playing in the background where they look actually at the bladder of this mouse because they work on trip channels. Trip channels are involved in incontinence and they wanted to know when this bladder is actually voiding, well, when the mouse is voiding and the bladder is emptying. So they wanted to detect it and they have done this in the past with anesthetized mice, but sleep and voiding or peeing is not, you know, there is some influence. So they needed to do this with live ones. And as you see in the movie, this mouse moves around and the contrast goes completely through the roof. One needs to do something about this. And this is real time video rate images. So 30 frames per second. Um, and they can do movies of 45 minutes. You can e quickly see this is really a lot of images very, very quickly. And they say like, well, we can image another mouse tomorrow, right? Um, so no one is going to draw all these lines around this bladder that is there. So we thought we can use some tools here for deep learning to actually detect this bladder and um, measure this. But we only had the tools available for live microscopy. So applying this and making them happen for this medical imaging modality was actually a bit of a challenge. And um, we are very happy that we actually succeeded in this. And this is, the story by itself is longer, but I don't want to dwell into this here for that long. It's more of showcasing that this is an opportunity where you can literally have possibilities to link different knowledge from different sides, also in the analysis world to do this kind of uh, things. Coming to um, optical instrument development, we have seen here already some parts in, in, in uh, a development lab, um, but I wanted to take a different approach to this more from an abstract point of view, because if you would want to do instrument development, I think we need to um, 
think about it more in an abstract fashion and I think from what is the possibilities and what we can actually do because often we in facilities would look at adapting a device or changing a device and what is the constraints that are actually imposed to us. So what is often presented is this iron triangle which uh, you know keeps um, different aspects of this triangle uh, straight while one is actually loose. It's not necessarily connected to depth, resolution and speed. This could be other parts. But the idea here are these showcases. If you compare, for example, light sheet and um, oblique uh, plane illumination microscopy, a problem is that if you would focus on two of these aspects, basically the, this, the third one is something that is loose and which you can't determine. This is when you create a new device from scratch even more prominent because you will have to deal with this on multiple levels. You not only have to deal with resources and the scope of the device, you have to deal with, and let's say, a list of these iron triangles, both for hardware and for software, where, for example, the availability of um, already drivers and libraries will determine some of the other aspects of your technology development. And along these lines, I want to come to the point where it's an, maybe important to decide when do you want to engage and uh, build a device. We have created this slightly uh, complex uh, uh, graphic where the question comes about when is it making sense even to develop or buy something. And often when there's a new publication coming out, it might be a new development, a new article that appeared, and literally at this moment you cannot buy it. So there's the only option is to basically to import it from the developers. When there's a number of fundamental uh, papers out there, you can say like, okay, now I understand how to build this and I can do this maybe my, my own. If you're late in the process, like by now, likely you would not be engaging into uh, building a new um, uh, confocal uh, uh, scanner because they are so well integrated and, and so well built, they would be very, very hard to compete out on here if you don't have a very competitive edge on this. So the questions that you have to ask, I think, is, is there an added value for the community? Is this something that we actually can add to the whole uh, scheme? And um, or maybe are you developing for a niche that we cannot buy and where we ahead of this curve of commercial applications? Also, for your own size and institute, it may be important because if you are very small, but you have resources, it can be an opportunity to grow. But if you have a lot of users that actually are very tight and, and, and on your toes to get their things done, it might be too critical to spare time on developments. At the same time, if you're very at the high end and very big uh, facility, you may actually have to do it in order to keep up the, the service provision at the top level. Now with that, and I think here I'm, I want to go a bit quicker because I think time is running up, um, having a look at Claudia here already. Um, depending on where you look at, there will be different hardware choices that you can have to make if you want to build this. And there's different options, whether you want to adapt the setup, where you develop it on an open hardware thing, that's something that actually I think would be important to discuss overall, whether you do it on an optical bench, or if you import it from, from one of the developers. And what you end up with is, is, an, is a matrix of advantages and disadvantages of, uh, that are behind that that will have to be taken into account. Now, um, is that all? Uh, likely not. There's a number of other opportunities that you could uh, engage in, and I'm not going into detail in that. There's different applications for um, a service and, and uh, for other users. There could be you know, selling and providing equipment, developing clinical applications, something I haven't talked about. Um, innovation in collaboration can go very much further than just the probes that I've mentioned. And um, obviously there's also the possibilities to create spin outs and other stuff like already pointed out. So um, that being said, there's a lot of other stuff that can be um, innovated and that it may depend also on your environment. And here I think actually Eurobioimaging and the local bioimaging environments are a facilitator for that. I often talk about data workflows. I will not do this today, but I just want to mention that there is a possibility for all of these kinds of stuff as well, including um, uh, data innovation. And this has been actually encapsulated in industry by uh, the 4P model, because you can look at different dimensions for, the, for innovation, whether this is product, 
or process, position of the innovation, or even the paradigm of where, in which frame in an organization these things are happening. And with that, I want to actually start um, to, to, to close up and want to ask how you would maybe want to carry out an, an innovation project. And here, um, I think a step of multiple gates is important where you go from maybe an idea over a concept. Here it's called product and marketing because this is a slide I took from industry, but you can easily adapt this kind of idea towards the environment um, for facilities and move on. So um, basically my last question here uh, in order to wrap up is how do we keep and maintain the momentum how do we stay innovative? Because it's maybe not a one-off thing that we want to do because we may need to do this over and over again. And the question is, do we have a strategy? Maybe it's a good way to look at it by saying, um, we need to look at different opportunities and um, select how we want to go with them, check how we can implement them and also capture what we have done. Because I mean, when we created a new service, we want to also evaluate that uh, this actually provided the, the added value that we have been hoping for. In that sense, the questions here to connect to that is, do we have a clear strategy for that? And how does that you know, work with our um, organization? And with that, I want to wrap up. I want to state that there is actually a number of uh, legal considerations that I had no time to go into for today. And this is literally the fine print. I'm, I'm very happy to have discussions on this, but technically um, it's very important and I love to talk about it. It's a long fine printed slide, which I now will skip. And I will just skip forward to technically uh, my summary. Um, and um, this is where I want to say that we are living with core facilities and then uh, providing service to departments and stakeholders. Um, in this environment, I personally think innovation is key because otherwise we will be having a stagnation and that will be critical for our own uh, future. Um, often we're located at discovery-based life science. Discovery and development are not the same thing and it can be very important to make that distinguishment. Um, Projects within facilities can be very, uh, have a broad range from protocol optimization to technology adaptation, um, committing time and establishing workflows for these innovative, innovative activities is essential together with a roadmap to decide when do we want to go for this and not. And uh, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, I have been highlighting a number of publications and I'm very happy to provide all sources for anyone who would be interested. Thanks a lot.